Uh, thanks for the introduction, Brian. So today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak uh, to planning for liquid cooling. Um, prior to jumping in there, I'm going to speak about Cool IT, our company really quick, our, our technology, uh, and some of the drivers. So why, why are people looking at, at liquid cooling? So off the top, Cool IT has been around for, for about 13 years. Um, we rely heavily on a, a, for a small company, a fairly healthy uh, IP portfolio. Uh, we ship about 2,000 units, but up to 10,000 units per month of, of cold plate systems into the data center market. Uh, still shipping 30 to 50,000 into the desktop market, depending on seasonality. So that's really where we got our start. Uh, cool IT is, is shipping sealed um, liquid coolers into the desktop market for for workstations, for for gaming, for for anybody who really wants to the hardware accelerate. So imagine a, a whole bunch of liquid cooling systems stuck in desktops and some in some dark basements around the world. Um, we currently have about 1.9. Um, million units on the on the market so that that is both our, our closed sealed systems and our rack DCLC product that I'm going to talk about about today so rack DCLC um, uh, which is the product line that I'm the product manager for is, is one of two of our product lines as I just mentioned this is really our, our product that's focused on on servers and, and data center um, we, we have a very modular uh, and solutions-based approach to, to liquid cooling. Uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all uh, product. We really do work with our customers to, to figure out what they need in, in their server environment and their, in their compute environment. So we'll run through the modules really quick here. Number one is, is a server module. As easy as it sounds, this is what goes in, inside, your, inside your server. We have cold plates developed for, for CPUs, uh, for popular GPUs, and we also do memory cooling. Uh, we do customize uh, for, for alternative components, uh, chipset VR, FPGAs, ASICs, that type of thing, but most common is, is CPU and GPU. Uh, we approach liquid cooling with a passive cold plate. So our sealed systems do have pumps on them where they sit inside a desktop or server and, and circulate fluid uh, through, through the sealed system. What we're talking about here in the rack DCLC world is a passive cold plate. So it's only 15.6 uh, millimeters high which allows us to fit inside, um, of course, all one use servers, but, but even very tight blade configurations. Next on the module list is, is manifold modules. Uh, they're quite simple. It's a supply and return tube uh, that gets racked at the back of the rack, usually, um, just like a PDU, so, so it's quite simple. Um, it is equipped with a, with a whole bunch of quick connect sockets, and each individual server will plug into one level on this manifold. Essentially, what we're doing is delivering um, treated cool or, or warm coolant to the servers. Uh, they're picking up the load of the cold plates and they're evacuating it out the other side of the, the manifold. Uh, the manifold aggregates um, all of this, this fluid at the top with, with one single tube. And it's at this point that we have the option uh, of what type of heat exchanger we'll use. Uh, cool IT, I think, offers more heat exchangers than, than most liquid cooling groups. Again, it's, it's our effort to really support different types of compute environments. So on the left, you have our, our CHX, our coolant heat exchanger line of products. Uh, and these are for when you can bring facility water, um, or at least plumbing, onto the data center floor. Whether it's above the racks or below the racks, it does require a liquid to liquid heat exchanger, so, so plumbing onto the white space. Uh, if you do not want to bring liquid onto the white space, but, but you still want to take advantage of the, of the performance and density that liquid cooling allows, we do have uh, our AHX line of products, and, and these evacuate that load uh, back into the data center room. So, so not, not efficient, not efficient like warm water liquid to liquid cooling is. It's kind of like uh, the sports car effect, but, but get the, the big jobs done. So all the numbers inside these product names refer to a cooling capacity. So the CHX, for example, at uh, 30 degrees Celsius, sorry, we're Canadian, um, will cool 650 kilowatts and, and 40 kilowatts. The CHX40 is a, a 2U rack mounted, top of rack mounted heat exchanger. So it has two pumps inside, a liquid to liquid heat exchanger um, and, and a control system, which we'll, we'll review in a moment. The CHX650 on the other hand is a, a row based cooler. So it can handle 650 kilowatts. Um, you can split that up into, into roughly what 600 nodes. Uh, and, and you can put that in as many or as little racks as, as, as you'd like. 
So most of the numbers that I, I rattle off later are all based on our liquid to liquid heat exchanger, um, not the uh, liquid to air. Uh, one thing to point out here with Cool IT is that all of our systems uh, focus on, on centralized pumping. So that, that works in tandem with our, our passive coal plates. So none of the pumping is, is in the server node. All the pumping happens at the heat exchanger level. So we have quite a few deployments now of rack DCLC solutions uh, around the world, um, most of them in, in pretty regular data centers or, or data room environments. Uh, this one was irregular, and, and it was pretty exciting to be a part of. So Intel approached us, uh, I think the, the first weekend, September, prior to uh, SC13, and, and asked if, if we could help them cool down a, a two-rack cluster that they were going to run live on, on the show floor. So we thought, sure, uh, we'd love to be involved, and, and we hopped on. Uh, and to our surprise, everything came together and, and, and was both tested and run at SC. So what it was was uh, 131 teraflop, 74 kilowatts in, in two racks. Um, it ranked number 41 on the, on the green 500 list and uh, was subsequently donated to uh, UNLV and, and now lives physically at the SuperNAP Center in, in UNLV, or sorry, at, uh, in, in Las Vegas. Um, now outside of being a, a supercomputer that was run on the trade show floor, which is pretty cool, what really excited the people that were involved, and I think some of our, our customer base, was that all of these components were off the shelf. So we pulled off the shelf Intel, Intel parts, off the shelf Supermicro parts, and off the shelf cooling parts to create a liquid cooled supercomputer in two months. So here's a snapshot of, of where Cool IT deploys um, our rack-based components. Um, we're, we're seeing most of our business still in the U.S., though we are seeing quite, a, quite an uptick in, um, in, in Europe. I think there's a lot of funding right now for, for green HPC, um, or at least for the, the research uh, for that type of computing. So everyone's talking about liquid cooling. Well, wh why do we need liquid cooling? I grabbed these, uh, these two graphs from Emerson Networks data center 2025 report. Um, the first one just shows where, where the 800 respondents collectively thought that, that power densities would be uh, in, in uh, 10 years. So to this group, I don't think 40 kilowatts uh, sounds that strange anymore. Um, pushing to 80 kilowatts, that, that's quite high, but uh, maybe we get there in 10 years. The, the second graph looks at um, how much IT space uh, will consume. And, and what most people are saying is that, is that they see that shrinking. So we're going to have more IT equipment in, in less space. We're probably going to have some challenges. We're going to have some power and cooling challenges. So how are we going to deal with it? The last graph that I'll snag from the report is, is most likely with a combination of, of air and liquid. And I think that's a comfortable idea for most. Um, what really excited me on, on this graph is that we're going to see less dependency on, on cold air and compression-based systems which really is going to, to drive efficiencies at the, at the data center level. Uh, for a guy who sells air and liquid systems, that's a pretty exciting number to see there. So what, what are the drivers? What? So, and yeah, and we'll go into that a little bit here. You know, they didn't, they didn't explain it all that much, just air and liquid sort of a combination, which I think is fairly common today. We'll go through Fujitsu and IBM and how they've done it for a long time, how Cool IT approaches it, versus uh, strictly e immersion. So, so no air cooling except for comfort cooling really needed in the room. So the drivers for, for liquid cooling and, and why um, you know, some, great, some groups might look at it is really performance, efficiency, uh, and density. So what do we mean by performance? We mean first, uh, hardware acceleration. I guess it's where we got our name in the desktop market. It's how we were pulled into the data center market. And there still are quite a few groups out there doing it. Now, if we look at high frequency trading, for example, it's getting more bang for your buck. It's really stretching that, that processor. Um, but from a performance standpoint, it also allows the, the processor manufacturers to, to sort of you know, design to new parameters. If, if they understand that cooling is available for, for a more brawny um, or more powerful chip, they, they can begin sort of thinking down that path. I like this slide. 
Uh, I've seen it used in, in, in a few different presentations, uh, Mike Patterson for sure. Uh, the, the cooling power of, of a glass of water is, is roughly the same as a, as a room of air. So what does that mean to the data center folks here? It, it means that we can, we can improve OPEX by using, by using water, and really by using warm water. So we'll go through the ranges of cooling technologies here in a moment, but, but typically they range from about 60% up to 100% load capture into water, in, into warm water. This means that we can reduce, or in some cases in, in the total uh, load capture, we can eliminate some of the more traditional infrastructure pieces that we see in a data center. And as we all know, some of the more um, uh, expensive uh, infrastructure components. In the server level, we also talk about efficiency. We can reduce the, the fan power, uh, the total fan power consumption inside the server. We recently did a, a um, with, with Supermicro on their twin squared unit uh, server, and, and we saw that we had a 76% reduction in fan power, so a total of 150 watts saved at each server, uh, and that kept, that was at 100% CPU, CPU utilization, it kept the, the DIMMs and the CPU below 60%. Sorry, 60C. Uh, we also have reduced leakage current. So by running the, the components cooler, cleaner, we're going to save some electricity there as well. Your mileage varies here. It depends on, on how big a server you're using. This was on a dual CPU, I believe, dual uh, five core processor unit. And finally, density. Um, I think this is the, the call we get most often. And we get guys calling saying, hey, Pat, we, we have a room that, that we're using for, for our cluster right now or our, our compute environment. And we're running out of air cooling. We have power, but we're running out of air. What, what, what can you help us do? Uh, and what we can help you do is, is load that rack up. You know, I'm sure if I asked by a show of hands how many people here have, have less than full rack loads of servers, there would be, there'd be quite a few in the room. Um, so what happens here is, is we can evacuate with coal plates um, about 70%, depends if there's GPU involved, maybe up to 80% of the load out through the warm water and up to a more passive cooling uh, unit on the roof, the side, whatever. Um, and, and allow that air cooling to pick up essentially what it was before. So this does require that you have the, the power available in the room to, to boost up your, 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 uh, your compute. Um, now pretty common we get, we get a call and it's not to fit into a whole bunch of uh, you know, dual socket. One you know, it's hey, how can we cool um, with these, these vertical blades inside the, inside the rack. So densities keep on increasing, and what we're able to do is, is allow people to stay inside their, their footprint for, for longer. So a lot of these opportunities that we're working on are actually retrofit opportunities, where we walk in and, and we'll convert servers inside the racks that are already there. And I know that a lot of our, our uh, competitors in the market are doing the same thing, right? So, so we're, we're making IT, um, so compute spaces, white, white space, last longer. So we've got to get the lingo down. Um, the thermal guidelines for liquid-cooled data, data, data processing environment excuse me, uh, were released in 2011 by ASHRAE TC 9.9. Um, until very recently, I think people just talked about liquid cooling or warm water cooling or hot water cooling. But what does that really mean? And, and really, it, it, it needs to be qualified, and, and it is here. So for a long time, I think we've, we've used W1 water fairly, fairly well in the data center. Um, that's chiller-based water. W2 water takes it to the next step. It's, it's 27 degrees Celsius water in, in some environments. Um, NREL, for example, with their HP Apollo 8000 system, can produce W2 water all year round with the, with the dry bulb they have in that climate, um, uh, just using a cooling tower, which is, which is amazing. It's fantastic. More often, though, W2 water is produced by, by a cooling tower with a chiller assist. W3, W4 water is where it really gets interesting and where we see quite a bit of savings for the, for the data center. At, at W3, um, you can use a cooling tower uh, almost, you know, I won't say the entire year, very, very high percentage of the year. It's going to be 80% plus in, in most North American environments uh, with some chiller assist. W4, we can use a dry cooler almost anywhere in the world year round. So what this translates to for, for, for the data center folks um, is really, we need to understand these numbers here and what it will take in your region pr to produce that. So as we go through the, the next slide, that I may reference these numbers here. A lot of the warm water liquid cooling technologies are living in this W3, W4 range. 
So if you go on Google, and I'm sure a lot of you have liquid cooling, you're going to come up with, with quite a few different uh, brands and names. I think there's, there's quite a few now uh, reputable vendors of liquid cooling in, in the market. Uh, some are, are produced by the server manufacturers themselves. We saw SGI earlier. Of course, Fujitsu, IBM, Bull, um, RSC, Meg, where these different groups have been producing uh, liquid cooling for some time. So I'll start with direct contact liquid cooling, which is what, which is what again, Cool IT does. Um, there's several different ways of, of going about it, and, and you have your options when you're looking at liquid cooling. Uh, some of the vendors produce their own. Uh, again, the Fujitsu and the IBM examples have been around for, for a really long time. These are rigid copper, copper structures, rather, that, that fit that server type. Um, they're not adapted to, to other servers. Cool IT um, and several others in the market approach it with a more flexible solution, where we have pull plates that will fit all popular CPUs, and then different lengths of tubing and different barb orientations and things that allow us to adapt to different servers. It's really a more vendor agnostic approach to, to the solution. Uh, you'll then have your, your option of going for centralized versus distributed pumping. Um, lots of questions to ask around the different architectures. Um, uh, points of failure, points of redundancy, um, there's, there's, there's differing thoughts on that in the market, so ask the question. Plastic or metal quick connects, I think most common uh, is to use metal quick connects in, in the marketplace. Uh, we don't see many plastic quick connects. There's concerns over the absorption of, of fluid into the plastics and swelling over time in a warm environment and, and what that means to an, an integral connection. But there are lots of, of metal quick connects available. Uh, we work with groups like Stobley, S uh, SMC, um, and, and colder. Um, so again, ask questions. What, what does it mean to include a metal quick connect? What does it mean to include a plastic quick connect? Um, and then I think I mentioned tied to, a, to an individual IT uh, architecture. So if, if you're buying a solution and it comes with liquid cooling, great. If you would like a certain server and it doesn't come with the liquid cooling solution, well, you do have options for that as well. So the next technology has really got a lot of press through the last two years. I think it's a, it's a pretty sexy technology, and that, that's immersion. Um, has the, the major benefit, of course, of, of capturing 100% of the, of, the, of the load. Um, so this is, this is known as mineral bath. Um, in this scenario, you would have to change your, your spinning disks to, uh, to, to solid state drives, and you need to relocate any optical connections to, to outside of the water. Of course, the, the groups that work in this area have, have got that mostly cased. Um, and uh, I think Green Revolution is familiar to most two groups, and, and that is where you would lay the, the rack on its side, sort of a, a mineral bath, a mineral tub, and it gets filled with, with mineral oil. Um, there are other options. There's Isotope out of the UK, who so it's more of a, a clamshell approach where it's a sealed server, um, and Liquid Cool Solutions has a similar approach to that. Uh, I think they, they adapt their technology more for, for the ruggedized market. Two-phase immersion. Uh, this picture comes from a test that we recently did just to figure out, hey, what's all two-phase talk, talk about? Um, I know there's quite a few groups right now working with 3M to, to try and figure, figure out the best way to, to market and bring to market a, a two-phase solution. Uh, we haven't seen much yet, in, especially in the standard compute environments for, for two-phase, but it's certainly an exciting technology, and I think we'll hear more about it in, in, in coming years. The last technology that I'll touch on here is, is rear door. Uh, I think you know, three or four years ago, rear door solutions were, were, were fairly, let's say, uncommon. But, but now we see them all over the place. We see them in lots of different data centers. Uh, you, you can pick a few flavors. Um, you can have active or passive rear doors. Uh, I see that Patrick's here. So if you have any questions about rear doors, you can ask him after. Uh, you could also choose between single phase and two phase. Um, you know, the questions that I would have around that are, are in uh, non-heterogeneous racks. How well does a, a passive rear door work? Um, in that situation, you may want to have uh, an active rear door. Uh, we've heard situations where uh, the switches or maybe power supplies can't overcome the, the pressure, and they're sort of uh, moved out of the way, picked out of the way by, by the server fans themselves. The obvious benefit, again, just like immersion to rear door, is that it's 100% load capture. It's, it's a room neutral solution. Uh, these also fit onto all common racks. So if you have some hot spots, you have some high density racks that are sitting next to, to standard, maybe lower density racks, to put a rear door on that, on that rack is, is not that difficult anymore. 
The, the offset with, with rear doors is that uh, you de do need a relatively high flow of, of low temperature water. Right? So again, mileage will vary. It depends on, the efficiency depends on, on the environment that you're in and in the region that you're in. So a few more things that you want to talk to your, your liquid cooling vendors about um, as you're sort of scoping out the landscape is number one, reliability. There's lots of discussion uh, on material compatibility and fluid chemistry. So a mixing of, of certain metals uh, inside the system as well as the type of fluid that you're going to have circulating. So we need to be careful for fouling, for, for corrosion, for, for scaling. Anybody who's been in the space for a long time should have a pretty good answer for that. They should be able to show you all the different materials they use. They should have compatibility studies done. Uh, you just need to ask the questions. Fluid discharge, that's the, the big elephant in, in the room, otherwise known as leaking. Um, you know, it's, it's not something that, that we like to talk about in, in the world of liquid cooling, but it's a question that you need to ask. You know, have you ever seen a leak with your system? What types of seals do you make? You know, are they, are they brazed cold plates? Are they O-ring cold plates? Are they plastic quick connects? Are they metal quick connects? Right? You know, when, when we deploy small clusters of, of several nodes, sure, we, we may not ever see anything. But when you're, you know, deploying this across a, a large data center with, with thousands of nodes, you may see something. So, you know, and that, that jumps down to control too, maybe we hit that quick, is, is if something does happen, what are you going to do? What types of alarms and control systems do you have in place to, to deal with that type of situation? So serviceability, do you have access to the components, to the servers, just like you would in an air-cooled environment? Some technologies you will have access, and other technologies you will not. Do you need to have any special tools or any special knowledge to work on the system? And, and does it require special handling? So if I look at, at the design theory of the Rack DCLC product for Cool IT, when, when we were thinking of the product um, and adapting it from the desktop to the data center market, we really thought to ourselves, could the same person that works on the IT day in, day out, work on the liquid cooling system? So when we ship our systems, um, outside of the, the CHX 650, but the CHX 40, it ships filled and charged with coolant. Our manifolds ship filled and charged with coolant. Our server modules ship filled and charged with coolant. So everything is, is more or less plug and play. It's not quite that simple, but, but we do try to take some of the complexity out of it. Required infrastructure changes is, is really a big thing, and, and if you are vetting different vendors, you will want to ask questions around this. Uh, and, and what I mean by this is, can I use the same data center environment, white space environment, or rack environment that, that I have been thus far? This is especially important for, for retrofit builds. You know, do I need to use an upright rack? In immersion cases, you, you need to have a, a rack that lies down. Does that take, um, you know, is that taken into consideration? Lastly, control and monitoring. Uh, I, I think you all expect that your air cooling systems can be controlled and monitored. There's no reason that your liquid cooling system shouldn't be controlled and monitored. So what types of alarms do we have for, for leaks, for flow, for temperature changes, for pressure changes? Uh, how do we report those alarms? You know, is it emailed? Is it, does it work through standard uh, data center languages? So let's say you've you selected your, your liquid cooling vendor, you, you've purchased the gear, and you're ready to install. Um, what, what is different than, than just installing a, you know, a standard air-cooled system? You know, not all that much, but there are some key differences, and, and really the key differences are with the stakeholders. So uh, it, it may be common to, to invite your, your data center infrastructure folks and your, your IT folks to, to the party. When you're deploying liquid, because it's new to everybody, you really want to invite the, the manufacturer, so, so that the people who have developed the liquid cooling, you want to invite the, the group who is going to be um, responsible for the plumbing in the data center. Everybody should come together, of course, for, for a huddle. There should be a, a review of a plan and a pre-commissioning checklist that gets figured out weeks in advance. Um, we run into situations where we get a call in labor where groups haven't done this, um, and it really does lead to issues um, during, during the installation process. Once you get everything installed, you're going to move on to commissioning. Again, you want uh, most of these, these stakeholders on site. Um, you really want to understand what you're about to do and, and plan for any um, irregular activities that might happen. Right? If, if the plumbing didn't go perfect underneath the floor and you do spring leak, what, what, what are we going to do? How do we turn it off? Who's responsible for it? How long does it take? Uh, is the IT on? Do we need to bring any other uh, servers and, and compute nodes down? Um, an appropriate functional test should be completed. So when we set up a liquid cooling system, we always 
uh, test the liquid system before we test the liquid system with the, the IT, of course. And that, that means that having all the, the compute nodes off, we run functional tests on flow, on pressure. Uh, we look for any weak spots in the system. And we do that not just with ourselves, with the customer, but also their usually third-party contractor that's on site. So, so they're, for lack of a better term, plumbing group. Um, last thing you should do with commissioning is make sure that you set up all the alarm par parameters. It, it's one thing for your system to have um, these different alarm settings. We want to make sure they're set up. So uh, setting the min-max on, on temperatures, flows, on, on um, uh, pressures are, are all very important. Service and maintenance. Cool IT does, uh, in the first year, three-month, six-month, and 12-month checks. The, the first checks uh, are really not for, for our hardware itself, is to check for, for fouling. Uh, so we're checking the, the fluid chemistry. So we'll draw off a little bit of coolant. We'll send it to the lab. Um, and if need be, at that point, we put, we put a little bit of coolant back in. Um, I, I think the same should be expected for, for most uh, liquid cooling groups, and as far as I understand, they, they all do have that capability. Um, so what is the new protocol for cooling device? So, so what I mean there is, do the folks that are going to be working on the IT understand what the differences are when they go to work on, on, on their server? So is there anything that they need to be aware of? Uh, in our case, for example, they would need to understand that when they unplug the power to draw that server out, they also need to disconnect the, the quick connects. It's not difficult, but that should be noted in the, in the SLA. That's it. The, uh, a few reference groups, if you're interested in liquid cooling. The Green Grid has recently set up a, a liquid cooling work group. Uh, it it's really is brand new. It's, it's only about uh, two or three meetings old. Um, we're still in the process of, of picking a chair. And I think it's going to be a pretty influential group. I, I had heard that it was the, the largest um, sign up for any group that, that uh, the Green Grid has, has started. Uh, ASHRAE TC 9.9 .9 has been doing a lot of work around liquid cooling at data centers uh, for, for quite some time. Um, of course, that's where the liquid cooling classes came from. If you're not familiar, check that out. And then finally, uh, the EEHPC work group. They have a subcommittee on liquid cooled commissioning. And there really is a lot of good practical knowledge um, out, out of the papers that have produced there, um, experience-based knowledge. So, so have a peek. And that's it. Thanks for having me. Any questions?